Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, these are low lights, apparently. Yeah. They're still incredibly blinding. So, uh, my name is Dirk Hondel. You are? And I'm Linus. And the reason we do it this way is I, I may have been doing this for 30 years, but I still can't do public speaking. So, the, the way to solve my speaking problem is to have more of a Q&A like thing and a chat in front of you people. So if something goes wrong, there's somebody else to blame. If, if the session is good, it's great answers. If the session is bad, it's stupid questions, just so we have that yeah. out in front. So it's great to be back in Seattle. It feels like we were here just two and a half years ago, which is, I think, because we were here just two and a half years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised to be back, but it's super convenient. We both live in Portland, so it's a relatively easy drive up I-5 and no time zone changes. So I'm very glad we're back in Seattle. And that new Congress Center is gorgeous. Oh my god. If we could see any of it. No, I mean, if you look at the wooden planks hanging on the roof, it is, it is really pretty. I love it. It's nice. Um, so Linus, we traditionally start these conversations with uh, a bit of reminiscing of where you are in the kernel. We are at 6.9 RC4. Um, things seem to be calm and steady and boring. Well, uh, calm and steady and boring is what I aim for. And it should be. I mean, uh, with a 30-year-old project plus, um, it shouldn't be one of those things where, where new and exciting things happen. Uh, and I've actually been saying that for decades, that if you want, if you want excitement, you go and look at some of the hype areas, and if you want to really know how the nitty-gritty of, uh, of the hardware works, that's when you get into kernel development. And well, but we all know kernel development does include a lot of drama and a lot of high-stakes discussions. Right. So, for example, a really important topic that once again has reared its ugly head is taps versus spaces. Oh, Christ. No, that's, that's really a detail that you shouldn't have gone into. Now, we, we have a lot of uh, small, odd tools. And, and last week, we had another one where, where people didn't realize that white space is white space. And when you parse it wrong, you get the wrong answers. But it, this is the kind of details that happen all the time and the kind of excitement we see in the kernel community. Uh, but uh, it's kind of a fact of life that there's a lot of small small things that go on to actually create a product when you have a few tens of millions of lines. And I, I think it's kind of uh, a sign of the maturity of the project and the health of the project that a, a small comment on, on this is enough to create press articles about because there isn't any other drama going on, which I think is, is a very positive sign. But of course, there is always drama. And, and if, you, if you run a, a kernel project, obviously there are a lot of problems that are outside of your control that you end up dealing with anyway. We had yet another round of hardware bugs that caused well, new sets of changes. I have lost track how many we've had of those in the last decade. It's been a few. So it's been very frustrating. And it's been frustrating not so much because of the bugs themselves. I got into doing kernels because I'm interested in the hardware. So in many ways, when these security bugs happen in hardware, they're really interesting. They are, they are literally why I do kernels, understanding how the hardware really works and, and taking advantage of it, but also in the case of, of, of the bugs, having to work around them. The thing that then is very, very frustrating is that you have these technically interesting problems, but then they are made to be a horrendous experience by all the secrecy and the fact that you can't work on these interesting problems in the open, which I mean, the other part of Linux obviously being the, it's not just that I was interested in hardware, but I love just the, development model where you can talk to people and work on interesting stuff. And the security issues we've had over the last decade have kind of destroyed that for me and, and have been a huge frustration and, and, and a huge negative. And it's kind of sad because it's really just about the process is horrendous, but the 
the challenges would otherwise be pretty interesting. Well, here is your chance to talk about the next three already before the embargo is lifted. No? Uh, no, I can't. Okay. It's sad. Actually, I don't Try think it. we have. <laughs> don't, don't go there. Um, but so uh, the, the common pattern of, of the last few, the last many of them, is always these side channel attacks, is always these unexpected consequences of the optimizations in the silicon and, and how that leads to different timing that allows you to draw conclusions. And so isn't that incredibly fundamental? We now see them finally in Apple Silicon because people test Apple Silicon more. Is this, we're gonna have this forever? Oh yeah, I mean, a lot of these issues are very fundamental and that is to some degree what makes them interesting. The problems become, the, the problems come up not because the CPUs are doing out of order and speculative work, it's because then to software, they only expose the architectural side, mm -hmm. the side that you're supposed to see, the end result. And then that often makes it very hard to work around for software, the, the fact that sometimes they speculate and do things that software didn't tell them to do. And, and almost always the solution to the technical problems is that the hardware then gives us as kernel people, but also as web browser developers, gives us extra knobs to say, in this situation, you need to be a bit more careful. And, and uh, it's one of those things that, as a software developer, it frustrates you because the, we can often react quite quickly in software, but then the hardware people are saying, oh, we have five generations of hardware that we can't fix after the fact. And it will take another couple of years before the actual new hardware that can help you work around the problem comes out. And that ends up being very frustrating uh, with the whole added uh, side of, of all the PR and uh, <laughs> uh, that goes along with any security issues. Well, so you, you talked about the fact how much you love open development and how that secrecy is annoying. So is an, is an open source hardware architecture a differentiator here? I mean, risk five is, has come along quite nicely in the last few years. Is that an, an improvement? Will that be better with RISC-V? I, I, you know, my fear is that RISC-V will do all the same mistakes that everybody else did before them. I mean, we saw this very much, one of the frustrations when ARM became a, a server platform and became much more relevant for, for that side is they redid all the mistakes that we had already, I had already seen <laughs> a decade or two earlier on x86. And, and it, they fixed them more quickly because by now people have learned something. But, but I'm, I'm just looking forward to when RISC-V becomes more of a big, widely deployed platform. They'll have all the same issues we had on the ARM side and that x86 had before them. And it will take a few generations for them to say, oh, we didn't think about that because they have new people involved. But, but that's the question. I mean, obviously, hardware is very different from software because of the, the lead times to make changes. Yep. But isn't an open source architecture kind of an opportunity for the software guys to come in early and say, oh, by the way, over here, what you're doing here, let's not do this because we've tried this and we know it doesn't work? Or I, is it just that no one listens to us software people? I, I think the issue is that the, even when you do the hardware design in a more open manner, uh, hardware people are different enough from software people. There's a fairly big gulf between the very log and, and even the kernel, much less like higher up the stack where you are working in with so far away from the hardware that you really have no idea how the hardware works. So it's really hard to kind of work across this very wide gulf of things. Uh, and I suspect the hardware designers, uh, some of them have, I mean, there is some overlap, but, but they will learn by mis doing mistakes, all the same mistakes that have been done before. That, that, that seems so inefficient. Um, 
I mean, you, you obviously have worked at a, at a CPU company before. You've, we've worked on that side. I, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated that we don't have a way to help the RISC-V people to, to do better because it's, it's kind of cool to see an open source architecture and maybe we can show that there's more to it. Well, I mean, to some degree, doing hardware now, I think, is easier. Um, I, I, you see it in the, on the ARM infrastructure side, how it took ARM first on the 32-bit side and then on, now on the 64-bit side. It took a few decades to, mm -hmm. to really get to the point where, where ARM and x86 are competing on a fairly equal ground because there was all this software that was fairly PC-centric. Yeah. And, and that has passed. And that will make it easier for new architectures like RISC-V to then come in. But at the same time, when you do something new, for whatever reason, whether it's because you want to have an open architecture or because it's, you come up with a new idea and you go, nobody else has tried this, I will do that. Most of the time, you will mi make mistakes. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, most of them will fail completely without ever, ever anybody hearing about them. <laughs> but even the successful ones take a stumble or two. But I mean, what you said is true. Um, 10 years ago, moving away from, from x86 to a different platform was still incredibly hard. Today, most people don't even know whether you're running on a Graviton or an Ampere yep. or an AMD or an Intel chip. It's, it's in the cloud, it all looks exactly the same. You have the same software stack, just the price point is different. Well, I mean, that was one of the promises of open source and, and people were saying that this was true 10 years ago, and it wasn't true 10 years ago, but it is it's certainly reaching that point now. It certainly is today, yeah. yeah. But let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, we talked about security, we talked about the, the challenges that come from the hardware up towards us. Let's go the other way, let's look at user space. And of course, the last few weeks, a lot of people who care about security have learned a lot about XZ and yeah. about the, the um, pretty amazing, and amazing in a bad way, uh, long, very long planned and well executed attack on the ecosystem. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about this. Well, so I'm hoping people know the background. I'm not going to go very much into that, uh, where open source in many ways relies on a certain amount of trust. Mm -hmm where you trust the developers, you trust your co-maintainer, you trust the people around you to do the right thing. And uh, honestly, it's not true just in open source. I mean, it's true even in, in proprietary source. The, you, you depend on the trust in the company, but also within the company, you depend on trusting your employees. And that trust can be violated. And uh, how to figure out when it's been violated is an open problem. And we've, we've seen this before. Uh, in the kernel space, we actually saw a, a university a few, several years ago that tried to do a study on how easy it is to upstream bad kernel patches. Yeah. And, and that's, that's actually an interesting study. They just didn't do it very well, and they didn't... They didn't tell a third party about this, and they, they just sent us bad patches. Uh, and uh, f understandably, maintainers A caught the bad patches, and B were really upset about this, and were going, hey, you're a university group, and we were kind of trusting you, and you broke that trust. And that really ends up being a... a very personal matter. We had maintainers who were very pissed off. Well, you were being experimented on. You yes. were the, the objects of an experiment, and that is in violation of a ton of ethics rules. Yes. You can't do that. Yes. But I mean, so we've both seen that kind of experiments, and now, not in the kernel space, but in, in another open source project, we've seen an actual malicious attack. And nobody really had any explicit gates in place to try to catch this. But what I actually see as a huge positive is that despite there not being any like explicit rules in place, let's try to catch malicious activity, 
both, in both cases, they were actually really caught fairly quickly. Yeah. So the XC attack had a history going back several years, but when the actual bad actor took advantage of becoming a maintainer, uh, it was found within weeks. It was pretty quickly. But so it was found randomly. It was found randomly, but, but my point is, random ends up being good. I mean, you yes. don't always, you don't always, you can't always have specific rules in place because it's kind of, when you have rules in place, the bad actors, they don't follow the rules. Uh, so they can try to work around whatever technical rules you have in place. And the fact that open source projects have found these kinds of attacks does seem to imply a fairly strong amount of stability and, and that these things do get caught. Yeah. Uh, so clearly it's a wake-up call. There's no question about that. And uh, there are a lot of people who are looking into various measures of trust mm -hmm. uh, in the kernel. I mean, we, we had, there are existing projects, PGP being one of the really classic one, which has this notion of a network of trust. And in the kernel, we actually use that amongst maintainers. Uh, but, but I think uh, we're going to see a lot of work being put into some kind of uh, trust model where, where people see, oh, this is a new person or this is a person that is acting differently from, from before. Yeah, uh, for no particular reason, I want to point out the engineer who found this was a German engineer, but it's just random. Um, uh, thank you, there's, there's another German in the audience. Um, <laughs> But I, I think what's so interesting about this, this whole notion of trust is in the after-the-fact analysis of these personas that were the bad actors, of course, they had none of the typical footprint that a real person would have. So uh, um, Brian Krebs had this interesting piece that he said, the email address used for these attacks never showed up in any of the data breaches any of the many Equifax, United Health, you know, name any com company, T-Mobile, anybody who has their data stolen. And, and all these email addresses are online. You can find them in databases. And the emails of these bad actors weren't in that data, which is an interesting way to define whether you're a real person or not. But, <laughs> right? But, so the, 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 Linux network of trust, one of the requirements for the signature is that you meet the person face to face and you are supposed to look at their government idea. Of course, a, a nation state aggressor can create a false government ID, but still there is, there is an additional level of difficulty. But to me, I think the, the biggest defense against all that is a healthy community. Yes. And the Linux kernel has this incredibly big, but also incredibly deeply entwined and connected community where there are multi-year, multi-decade relationships at the core of all Well, this. it is, I mean, that is true. At the same time, it is worth really pointing out how unusual the kernel is yeah. as an open source project. A, a lot of open source projects, even very central ones, are basically run by one or two or three people. And they may have many more people who occasionally contribute, but most open source projects are, are really fairly small. And, and uh, the kernel having like <laughs> just the number of main maintainers, depending on how you count, is between 50 and maybe 150. Uh, but we have a thousand people that basically participate in every single release every couple of months. What we do is not necessarily something that can translate to 99% of all the open source projects. But one of the things I, I believe we, and this is the larger we, all of us here in the room, the industry should be doing is we should be looking at the projects that are under underutilized, that are not underutilized, that are under supported yep. by their own community and by all of us who are using this software. I think there is this, this 
discrepancy of being a user of open source and depending on it deeply, and a, a certain responsibility to then to help solve the problems. And supporting a lot of these smaller projects, not with money, money is, is really hard in this case. What people are looking for is help. So engaging, you know, each of you works for a company, have your company adopt a couple of such projects and just participate, read the code, be part of the, of the reviews of the patches, provide just moral support to the maintainers. It's as simple as that. So I think there's a lot more that we can do. Not everything yeah. can be Linux. That would right. be uh, hard. No, I mean, this is, uh, I, I think this has been a wake up call for I mean, people have been talking about the infrastructure security for the several last years because of not necessarily bad actors, but just bad bugs. Yeah. And, and I think that will actually continue to be a main, the main problem. The, the, the bad actors may be interesting, but they are at the same time not going to be the common case. We are, we're very good at creating code, but part of that is also we're very good at then sometimes getting it wrong. And, and so, it, it happens even in the kernel community when we try to be very careful because of the area we're working in. Yeah, and no one is perfect. So this is, we, we talked about all these depressing things and let's go for something that's fun and entirely non-controversial. So let's talk a little bit about AI and large language models and... Uh, well. I like you, you're as cynical it's, as I am. That's, that's a good sign, that's a good sign. Um, so uh, obviously this is, this is the current hype kit on the block and, and if you want to double your salary, add AI to your title. And uh, it, it's hilarious to watch the, the self-description of, of companies and every company on earth has an AI angle to their story as of this year. It is yeah. amazing. Uh, but what I find so interesting is this idea that Gen AI is going to be the end of, you know, insert whatever, end of programmers, the end of authors, the end of movie creators, the end of so many jobs. So you are going to be replaced by an AI model. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't know. I, I hate the hype. Uh, at the same time, I think AI is very interesting. I, yeah. When I went to university, we were still talking about rule-based expert systems and Bayesian logic and, and all of this kind of thing. And it, it was called AI, but it was not in any way intelligent. Um, and, and I do think that the last few years have Neither been interesting. Neither is today's. Yeah. But uh, I... I don't want to be part of the hype. Yeah. And uh, I will say that the AI revolution has had, even on the kernel level, uh, a few positives. For example, uh, a company like NVIDIA, who is not exactly famous for being great at, at interacting with the kernel community, has actually been much more active and, and been involved in the Linux memory management code because suddenly they start caring about Linux when, when they are selling a lot of AR hardware. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be crypto and, and it's still obviously GPUs and, and it's being used in, in big servers and running Linux. So it has actually had a positive impact, but my personal opinion is let's wait 10 years and see where it actually goes before we make all these crazy announcements of your job will be gone in five years. Well, I think we already see lasting and, and almost irreversible change happen, happening through many of these AI tools, not on the hype gen AI front, but just at the, in the tools that make our lives better and easier. I, I keep calling it autocorrect on steroids and people are mad at me, but the, if, if you use an, an, uh, a Gen AI and hopefully an SLM tool uh, to help you with, with basically code completion in your editor, 
Isn't that a, a, a huge opportunity? So I'm, I'm actually, I mean, I'm one of those people who are very optimistic in, about AI, and I'm looking forward to the tools to actually find bugs. We have a lot of tools, tooling around the kernel and around any software projects, obviously. Uh, and uh, we use them religiously, but making the tools smarter is not a bad thing. And I, to some degree, compare it to writing things in assembly, which literally I started doing with the initial kernel was, I think, about 50% assembly language and using a compiler. And, and using smarter tools is just the next inevitable step. So that's going to happen, but I don't think it's necessarily the gloom and doom that some people say it is, and I definitely don't think it's the promised world that the people who are having their hand out for cash say it is. So uh, but, I, you need to be a bit cynical about this whole hype cycle in the tech industry. I hope yeah. you all realize that. It be, before AI, it was crypto. Before crypto, it was whatever. It's, it's a cloud native. Cloud yeah. native. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> there's a loud voice in the front. That's not hype. OK. I, I mean, the hype, there's always like a grain of reality behind it. But you need to be careful about all the BS around that grain. You can't say BS. Um, so, uh, so the beautiful science is what he meant. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> the, I look at these tools and I look at, you said assembler, and then we talk about compilers, then we talk about things like sparse, a compiler that tries to find certain kinds of bugs. We talk about Julia to do code refactoring. We have had, for the last 30 plus years, a sequence of tools that helped make development better and more robust. Yep. And in, in that lineage of things, I, I, I hope there is really cool stuff coming down. Yeah, the I mean, um, we have tools that do kernel rewriting uh, with very complicated scripts and pattern recognition and things like that. And, and that is actually literally why I think uh, AI can be a huge help, because some of these tools are very hard to use, because you have to specify things at a low enough level that the natural reaction would be to, hey, can we make this a bit easier and automate more of it? Uh, so, so yes. I. One, one of the interesting angles that this whole large language model and, and the, the training data brings up is the role that data plays in, in our modern world, where it, we all talk about open source, about the source code, the algorithms being available, but open data really is kind of that the, almost the more interesting question. No, today. it's not. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's not to me, and, and actually... I'd like to clarify that, I mean, the LF obviously has open data projects, and to other people it's more interesting. And that is, I think, the whole, for me, the point of open source is that different people are interested in different things. And, and uh, I was always interested in the low-level nitty-gritty of how the CPU actually works, which is why I'm working on the kernel still. But, uh, but yes, you're right that in many situations, what is important is the, is the data that you then use to generate pattern, find patterns and generate new interesting information with. But, but to me, that, that's not what I tend to do. And yeah, there I, is that saying, beautiful science in, beautiful science out. Mm -hmm. Please translate. Um, so uh, you, you talk about the things that you love doing. And I want to point out, it's been more than a decade since you started a project. And the world is kind of getting a little antsy. So where is the next Linus Torvalds project? Oh, no. Uh, I hope it never happens. Uh, and I say that because every single project I've started has always started from me being frustrated with other people being incompetent. Uh, so. <laughs> Or money grabbing, right? <laughs> so the reason I started doing Linux was that I couldn't afford the real thing, right? And, and I said, how hard can it be? And it turns out it can be pretty hard, because here I am 33 years later and, and still working on it. But uh, I made the same mistake then. It's 
20, plus, 20 years ago when I said, hey, I really don't think source control management is very interesting. And all these people before me, they clearly got me completely wrong. So, so I need to do my own. How hard can it be? Uh, and I'm actually hoping to never be in that situation again, uh, that, that there will be somebody else who comes and solves my problems. And I have to say, uh, I don't have any huge problems. Uh, L Linux, for me, solved all the problems I had way back in 92, maybe 93. Uh, and and it, if it wasn't for the fact that others came around and said, hey, I need this, I would not have continued. So, so while my products start with something that I need, the things that actually keep them going in then is then the fact that, hey, this is actually useful to other people because if it's only something for me, it's not really interesting in the long run. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I had a lot more fun questions. I guess I will have to ask you those in Hong Kong. Uh, but for here, for Seattle, thanks, everyone. I hope this was fun. All right.